you'll find that President Zuma, one of the questions he was asked when he sat with traditional leaders, um, one of them asked to say, but this is alien to us. We've never had, you know, uh, uh, homosexuality in, 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 for instance, in, uh, you know, in our culture. The state capture, President Zuma just allowed it because he didn't, that's how he is. He didn't want to be seen as if, you know, he had a hand in it. He's um, a transparent man and he allowed it to go ahead. That two-thirds is a loaded gun for whoever has it, right? I hear you. Okay. So I'm, I'm not a, I'm, in fact, I'm quite comfortable with the idea that no party gets a majority, and I think that's what is going to happen. Welcome to the State of the Nation, brought to you in partnership with Pace Car Rental. If you need to rent a car, Pace Car Rental are the people all around the country. You can get their cars wherever you need to travel in South Africa. Johannesburg, Durban, Cape Town, Kobecha, sheesh, they're everywhere. So use them. They're sponsoring this show. And it's because of that that we are able to really keep you up to date. Now, we've said it many, many times that this is a very important election, the 2024 general election. It's going to be a watershed election. There isn't, we haven't seen anything like this before in South Africa. And one of the big stories of the 2024 elections is definitely the emergence of the Mkonto Wisizwe party. That is throwing all predictions up out of the window and everybody needs to recalibrate their thoughts on the outcome of the elections. And joining me today on uh, the State of the Nation, spokesman for Mkonto Wisizwe, Tlamulo and Lela, who welcome, welcome to the State of the Thank Nation. You, Mike. Thank you. It's been a while. Uh, it's, it's been a bit of a been I've chatting, been, but uh, yeah. you've been looking for me, hounding me. I'm here I'm now. Hounding you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I've been hounding you because I think it's a it's a, it's an important story that people need to hear. You know, uh, people need to hear from uh, um, you know. It's one thing that we always do on the State of the Nation is that uh, I was actually speaking to somebody the other day saying that there's immediate assumptions that are made, you know, as to where people are and what mm. we are trying to do. Well, mm -hmm. what we are trying to do on the State of the Nation is keep people informed as to what's going to happen in South Africa. We like to question the answers as opposed to just ask the questions, you know. So um, let's kick off. Firstly, a big court victory in uh, over the IEC that had immediate, uh, originally mm -hmm. um, disallowed the, uh, the uh, Jacob Zuma from being um, your, uh, the face of your election and potentially a parliamentarian based on a, on the law that says if you've got a, a a prison sentence of more than a year within 5 years you're you're not available and um he had been sentenced to 15 months for contempt of court thanks to the Zondo commission but of course our president managed to give him a recession anything that would keep try and keep people happy he tried to do it he, so this Sentence was cut, and now Jacob Zuma is back on the ballot paper. Yeah, so we're, look, I mean, let's look at the genesis of it. Uh, the genesis of it is the uh, application by, you know, the uh, African National Congress. Specifically, I like to call it Mbalula's little project mm. uh, because it was caught napping. Uh, when Mkonto Sizwe as a party was I registered. Think he, I think he was in, in Ukraine trying to fight that war, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> Wasn't that where he was <laughs> at one point? Would you be surprised right? with Mbalula, right? Yeah. yeah. The, so, uh, look, he, he was sleeping on duty. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, all of a sudden had an epiphany uh, to, you know, take us to court when President Zuma announced on the 16th of December that he'd be campaigning for Mkonto Sizwe um, and voting for Mkonto Sizwe. And um, only then did, uh, you know, these court cases all of a sudden show up, questioning our, how we were registered in the registration process. And again, in that case, we were the third respondent, first respondent being the chief electoral officer, then the IEC itself, and then us as the third respondent. Uh, so <clears throat> that was, was an, an extremely important uh, case um, for us to win. Uh, in a sense that uh, it anchored us uh, in the political landscape to be able to, uh, you know, contest these elections. Otherwise, we would have been deregistered and then, you know, we wouldn't be having this conversation in the first place, let alone the, 
the case that we won uh, three days or two days ago. So, as of yesterday. So, I mean, sorry, I've just done so many interviews. Yeah. I actually lose how many, which, which day it is. But in any case, so um, th that I think is the first one, um, which in of itself was a landmark uh, outcome for us. So that landed us on the, on the ballot paper. Um, and then, you know, let's get back to the one now as it pertains to our rights as a party now that we registered with the IEC to choose, uh, you know, our candidate, our preferred candidate to be on a parliamentary list. Um, and the fact that from where we were sitting, the IEC was infringing on those rights, including President Zuma's political rights to, to participate and be the face of the party. Um, so that, it's a historical historical uh, outcome for us. Um, I, we know that most of our adversaries were hoping it doesn't happen that way because having President Zuma you know, on the ballot uh, in of itself, uh, it, it just speaks volumes to the voter and it brings about confidence to all those uh, people who have been wanting President Zuma to uh, stand uh, for these elections and be a presidential candidate. So it goes a long way, um, definitely for us. Um, so, yeah, here we are. We, we've won it, and President Zuma is going to be on the ballot. Well, you know, that's... that's and, and at the candidate list as well. Yeah, that, that's great, and that's news. But the reason that I've been um, um, chasing you so hard to get you here was that the one thing that's been lost in all of this, uh, I feel, is that as this thing has gone from one court case to another and one sort of statement uh, by Mr. Reddy and people like that, that, uh, and, you know, making these wild statements about, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, revolutions if you guys don't, you know, win by two, th all sorts of things. Anyway, it's all been sideshows. Now you guys are going to be there. MK is on the ballot paper with the face of Jacob Zuma, and that's yes. great. That's the starting point, right? Mm -hmm. But... We know very little about what Mkonto Wisizwe stands for. We hear that uh, the only thing that pertains to, to policy at all seems to be to send pregnant teenage girls to Robben Island. Um, other than that, I don't know. I haven't seen much in terms of policy. Now, I do understand that perhaps uh, you've been otherwise occupied. But if let's talk about the policies of Mkonto Wisizwe. Let's talk to people out there that are potential voters of, of MK. What are they voting for? Yeah, so I think what's important to unpack, first and foremost, is why, why, why Mkonto Wisizwe. Mm. And, then, and then we can talk about uh, what Mkonto Wisizwe will, will do for the people, or what we, what we aim to do for the people, which is part of our people's mandate. And I'll, and I'll get into that. But um, let's go back in history in terms of what happened. Uh, the ANC at the time was uh, for the natives and set up by the natives. There was an organization then for the natives, and they, it was only for the natives. So you didn't have any, uh, any other people of uh, any other color, white, uh, Indian, and colored, and so on and so forth. So the traditional leaders, as you may uh, you know, we're, 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 we're the real... This goes real back to 1912. Like 1912, effectively, yes. Now, um, as you then know, a lot has happened after that. You know, the ANC, I'm going to just really go, go through it quickly. Um, ANC, uh, at the time, they brought in politicians, the natives brought in politicians to try and lead and negotiate with the apartheid government. We'd obviously put this constitution as it pertains to land and all other issues that were against the native uh, agenda, let's put it that way. They were then disbanded as the ANC, um, and then President Mandela at the time with uh, Comrade uh, Joe Slovo decided that by virtue of uh, ANC being disbanded, they ought to find a different You way. talk about MK being disbanded? No, ANC, ANC being, disbanded, being disbanded, yeah, in 1960 when they right, ANC right, disbanded. Okay, yeah. right, right, okay, right. So in 1960, ANC disbanded, 1961, 16 December, which is synonymous with you know us having made our announcement on the December, December 16, 2023. So in 1961, uh, ANC, um, Conto was formed um, as a military wing of the ANC to take back the country by way of the bullet. Mm. And um, so, you know, we know what happened there. You know, people went out of the country. And that was, remember, the only uh, entity at the time, organization being the military wing, that uh, now, you know, you're allowed to be white, Indian, and colored and be 
a part of that. So any patriotic uh, South African that wanted to see change, that wanted the country back, uh, then formed, uh, joined Mkonto Wasizu. Fast track till today, we see this ANC being in the same way. We believe that this ANC, and we, that's why we refer to it as the ANC of Sudan Maposa, because this is uh, an ANC that is captured by white monopoly capital. Um, it has been straightjacketed in the same way by virtue of that 1960 ANC being disbanded. We're saying that this ANC is in effect the same position. Okay, so if we could just stop there, just in what way um, is this ANC of President Ramaphosa different to the ANC of his predecessor Jacob Zuma? Because it, it's not, it's not apparent that uh, much changed between uh, you know 2017 and 2018. No, we'll get to that. I mean, I'll tell you what the difference is. Mm. Um, but let's start with the fact that this ANC was bought. This president, uh, well, through his CR17 campaign, he bought himself into the presidency. Right. And it, he was sponsored by white monopoly capital. That's a fact. Yeah. And we know that it's documented and, and it's there. Uh, the mere fact that we've not even been able to see those CR17 statements in the first place, it speaks volumes. Okay, But we know there's billions that went into there. And that was to ensure that um, they carry through and they are protected in terms of their agenda. Um, their agenda to, you know, continue to purport, to, con to continue the, the, the current state of themselves benefiting themselves and various other programs, which we'll get into, you know, ranging from IPPs and uh, a myriad of other, you know, projects that we've seen where even the likes of ESCOM uh, is now being sold off, uh, you know, and uh, uh, unbundled. Um, to, like, to, to the point where even our ports are being sold off. Um, you know, it, it's, our country's being outsourced. Our country's being privatized. And this has never happened under President Zuma. Under President Zuma, we had an SAA, quite honestly, that worked. Um, we had lights. We had an ESCOM that functioned. We didn't have to unbundle it in order for us to get lights. Um, we, never, we didn't rely on IPPs. We didn't have, need IPPs in order to get an you know, alternative energy source. Um, and at the time, with, under President Zuma, we had BEE, and the economy was vibrant. And this sort of Maposa led government, everything is pro white monopoly capital, and that's a fact. Um, and more so, it's, this country's going into the doldrums, it's become dog's breakfast um, because there is no money flowing around, there is no jobs, um, there aren't any jobs. And, uh, you know, Cyril Maposa is comfortable with the status quo. And that's what's dis very, very worrying. And him and his ANC, um, they're sitting with policies, um, you know, in, in, in a book that continues to rot. And those policies are rotting in, in those policies. And they take decisions at um, conferences and they not implement them. I mean, he's sitting there with uh, a policy that says, nationalize the Reserve Bank. He's not done that. It, a number of other uh, res uh, uh, policies that are in there. Uh, but why won't they? Because they're bought and, and they, they are scared of their masters. And that's just the reality of the situation. Um, and so we say that cannot be an ANC of the people. Um, so we need to now bring, and that's now synonymous with history, find a different vehicle um, that will be for the people in the same way that we had Mkonto as the military. We're saying as Mkonto as, uh, as a party, we will. We want to win back our country by way of the ballot, as opposed to the bullets in there. Um, and, and we're saying that you know we want to ensure first and foremost that we change the constitution, because this constitution is based on Roman Dutch law. It doesn't represent the natives. Doesn't represent the South African child. It doesn't represent, represent us as Africans. Um, and when we say South Africans and Africans is you know um, it is un-African. Um, we're neither Roman nor Dutch, uh, so you know we, we don't understand why we, this this kind of uh, legal framework ought to be imposed on us when it doesn't even represent us. Um, you know, in terms of also our, our culture, cultures and our traditions. Here's here's a simple example: a Civil Act of 2006 um, it refers to uh, you know the uh, gay marriages, but which is celebrated when it was instituted in the Civil Act of 2006. But when it comes to polygamy, it's frowned upon. Why is polygamy frowned upon in an African country, but uh, gay marriage is, is, is celebrated? It, 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 it can't be. Um, 
So, you know, it's, it's, and we know that, you know, uh, gay marriage is, is it's, it's not, it's alien to our culture and our tradition. It's a fact. Um, in actual fact, that's why you'll find that President Zuma, one of the questions he was asked when he sat with traditional leaders, um, one of them asked to say, but this is alien to us. We've never had, you know, uh, uh, homosexuality in, 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 for instance, in, uh, you know, in our culture. Uh, where is this emanating from? Where, where is this coming from? And they were asking President Zuma that because they say we see it being law. How is it law? Um, and President Zuma had to explain to them that uh, you know we're obviously living in a different um, you know realm of of, of, of our lives, and uh, so we then there's certain uh, certain global uh, trends and cultures that are that are now being brought in. So. I, you know, and then then they want to see it as President Zuma's position. No, it's not necessarily President Zuma's position. He was just reflecting on, um, uh, you know, some of the discussions. But the point still stands. Um, why is it that polygamy can be frowned upon, but gay marriage is celebrated? I guess that that's that, that's, that's some of the the new answers that. Okay. Can be so if we can just uh, go back a step uh, to to what you said about uh, this being the ANC of Cyril Ramaphosa. Uh, Jacob Zuma was president for nine years. Many of these things, like you mentioned, uh, nationalizing of the Reserve Bank, um, why didn't he do that then when he was president? Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, look, remember, <clears throat> President Zuma at the time of his presidency, he never had a two-third majority um, you know, or, or leverage, let's put it that way, in the same way Thabo uh, Mbeki had a two-third majority leverage. Um, and I want to t I touch on Tabumbeki as well, because before I get to President Zuma, because Tabumbeki had the opportunity at that point in time when he had a two-third majority to to change the constitution, but instead he was more interested in changing the constitution to suit himself for a third term, um, which is in of itself tells you a lot about uh, how selfish he was, uh, unlike a selfless president such as President Zuma, who is willing to risk his benefits of presidency and coming out from retirement and still wanting to lead people because of the call of the people. So over and above the fact that Thabo um, you know, spent monies on arms deal when he could have actually used those monies on antiretrovirals um, and, you know, programs that ought to be uplifting our people. So we know that uh, his friends and his cronies uh, benefited from the transaction hugely. Uh, and off the back of that transaction, um, you know, the likes of uh, even certain shareholders of the banks uh, gave certain very close people to him shares. Okay. So, so that, 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 that's important to also highlight, right? Right. President Zuma comes in. He doesn't have a two-third majority. He's got a lot of adversaries around him in his NEC. So he wants to, to implement policies that are radical. He wants to... But he never even mentioned it as president. He never mentioned what, sorry. These radical policies that you talk of? No, no, no. I mean, he doesn't have to mention them to implement them. There's, but, there's a difference. But I'm so, saying he didn't even put them on, up for discussion. What do you mean by he didn't uh, put them up like for discussion? Things like nationalizing uh, the Reserve Bank. To use that as one example, I presume there's a few others, expropriation of land. Or thoughts. We know it's the laundry list. It's the usual uh, topics, right? When he was president, yeah. he never raised them. He was no great uh, reformer. He was no RET champion until he was out of the door. No, 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 no. no. I think that's 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 a misconception. Um, President Zuma has all. President Zuma didn't have to speak about the programs and be radical. Um, the fact of the matter is, he wanted economic transformation, and that's the reality. That's why you found more black uh, millionaires under his presidency because he opened up, you know, opportunities for black companies. I mean, under President Zuma. Um, let's look at Transnet, for instance, um, looking at, you know, black professionals. You had, uh, from what I remember, I think it was Nkonki and um, Sizun Zaluba at the time, merging to take over the, the, the Transnet uh, contract. I think it was external auditors, which was billions. I mean, that was handled by EY and Ernst & Young. That was their largest contract globally, by the way, for uh, external audit. No one knows this, right? Um, but... President Zuma said, here are two big black-owned businesses, merge and take over the contract. So President Zuma wanted black people, black professionals, and he respected black professionals, and he wanted them to play in the mainstream of the economy. Um, and that's why there was an emergence of many other big businesses under uh, President Zuma. So he doesn't have to say it. it that, not saying it doesn't mean you can't or you're not doing it. 
Um, President Zuma was there. He created a platform for many black professionals. Okay. President so. Zuma, um, you're going to say? No, 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 carry on. He's president. Um, president Zuma questioned the status quo of uh, you know, big companies, your Glencores and so on, always having green, co- uh, green, uh, evergreen, green, contract, green, evergreen yeah. contracts. It, it can't be. I mean, evergreen contracts with ESCOM, whereby the ESCOM pays double the tariff for coal and, and it's it, it it's not frowned upon it's okay but then all of a sudden when the guptas enter the fray it's a problem you know and they're only getting three percent give or take of the total contract i don't like to talk about the guptas and conto Caesar, but let's reflect on those kind of things right um it could have been any other just because they were none white it's a problem and and uh you know they, they continue to benefit under 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 the the, the, the current state now it's even worse. Black companies, black professionals have been sidelined from even participating in any contracts of that, of those mag- of that magnitude on, or, or, or size, um, let alone getting uh, work from government. It's, it's, it's unheard of. I mean, I, I'm a professional myself, former professional, a professional, um, have worked in, in the aviation space, have worked in the IT space. Um, for global, for multinational companies at a very senior level. I mean, I've been a president for an aviation company, for instance, um, IT-based. Uh, so it's an, it's an air transportation IT company, a global company. Uh, it manages 90% of all airlines and airport authorities and so on and so forth. I was a president for that for South Southern Africa. It's a company called CETA Aero. Um, you know, and uh, the, the reality is, um, you know, we, we know... And I'm not just now a politician, but I understand professionalism and I understand what it means to work for a corporate. Uh, and I can differentiate between the two. I've worked with the government as well. I mean, government was my largest client also from an IT perspective when I was at IBM, when I was at Novell, when I was at T-Systems. Um, and I know how the government machinery works. And I can tell you the difference between then and now. Um, under President Zuma's time and uh, under President uh, what would be Sri Ramaphosa's uh, government. Right. Yeah, it's chalk and cheese. That's just the reality. Okay. But yeah. Where, what would you, uh, uh, obviously, um, in the aftermath of, uh, of President Zuma's exit, there was the State Capture Commission, which he actually put in place, right? He <laughs> convened the State Capture Commission. Yes. Right. And uh, they set about doing this work for three years and pulled out volumes of uh, of reams of paper. reams of paper yeah. uh, that nobody seems to have done anything about. Really, uh, all that anybody did about, I suppose, was Gavin Watson driving to a <laughs> pillar, right? Yeah. But he has reams of documentation that say, to your point, that uh, many of those those things that that were going in President Zuma's days had been hollowed out and subsequently have fallen over. What do you say to that? Was uh, the State Capture Commission a hoax? The State Capture Commission of itself uh, is a form of state capture. You know, because here, here's the reality. There's billions of rands that were spent there. Um, how many lawyers or black lawyers actually benefited from that? Let me ask that question. We don't know. It's more so the big white companies that benefited from that. But also, the the state, by virtue of state capture, liquidated itself. I mean, you should actually read an article by Ben Cronin um, where he talks about this. And he talks about why must the state liquidate itself? It's a 2001 article. I think it was 29 May when he actually wrote that. Brilliant. 2021, sorry. Brilliant article. Um, Ben Cronin is a renowned advocate. And he talks to this. And he says, you know, you're sitting with billions of rands that you, you know, uh, budget and you allocate to this process um, called a state capture. Um, and then only when you've consolidated all these cases, uh, expect the NPA with no budget whatsoever to execute on that. Doesn't make sense. So you've actually replicated the, the NPA's job. What you ought to have done is just take that billion and give it to the NPA. Right. Why didn't you just do yeah, that? Agree. Right? If it's just crime, it it's crime. Yeah. Why did you need it? Uh, Why would you need it? Yeah. Exactly. So, Somebody uh, stolen money. So state don't... capture, President Zuma just allowed it because he didn't, that's how he is. He didn't want to be seen as if, you know, he had a hand in it. He's um, a transparent man and he allowed it to go ahead. Um, and, and that's how we find ourselves. So, but still, it was a waste. We should have taken that money. MPA today doesn't have money. They don't have the budget to even execute those yep. cases. But, okay, but... And what you have, by virtue of those same lawyers that were involved there, are capturepreneurs. You know, they, have, they themselves, that's why I say state capture in of itself 
is a state capture. State capture was state capture in of itself. Uh, we're bin uh, billions were, were were swindled, quite honestly, uh, whereas it should have actually been allocated to the NPA. So that's our position in state capture. And the findings? The findings are frivolous. I mean, um, if if they were solid enough, and you know, I'm sure they would have acted on them by now. It's it's just a marketing ploy. It's a politicking document. It's a politicking process. There's nothing else to it. Um, if there was anything solid out of it, there would have been some something solid that they would have come out of that. So. It, it was just a, 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 a politicking for the likes of, uh, what's his name, this, this man that is now Pravin Godan and Cyril Ramaphosa and, and his cronies, for them to, to, you know, to act as if they are doing something. The, the, the real state capture, real state capture is unbundling of ESCOM. That's state capture. Real state capture is selling our ports. That's state capture. Real state capture is outsourcing Transnet to Bidvest. That's state capture. D don't tell me about the Guptas. The Guptas have done nothing, man. They, 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 know, they know nothing about what, how the country's uh, economy structure is. If you want to see real state capture, look at what the banks are doing. Look at what the banks are doing in terms of uh, illicit foreign uh, uh, financial flows. That's the cap. The mere fact that they can uh, uh, you know, manipulate the, the, the rand for their own benefit and make billions out of that, and still accept and say, yes, indeed, uh, we, Maria Ramos came out and said the same thing. Yeah, look, we, we, we accept we did, uh, you know, uh, uh, on the side of, uh, you know, manipulation of the rand. Um, and then they just get a wrist, uh, slap on the wrist. No, I think the, the competition commission ought to be giving me more, 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 more teeth to bite. Um, and then they just get away with uh, a mediocre 10, 15 million rand fine when they've made hundreds of millions in a day. Does that make sense to you, Mike? It doesn't make sense. That's state capture. Uh, so, please, you know, if you're going to talk about state capture, look at what the structure of this economy is. Look at this JSC company. Look at the likes of Marcus Euster taking 350 billion rand that can be used for free education and going and squandering it, you know, in, in, in deals that are frivolous deals in, in, in Germany. It doesn't make sense, you know. Taking money from hard and uh, people with hard and money from people who uh, you know, blue collar workers uh, through and who contribute on a monthly basis from their mere meager salaries towards the PIC only for clever, uh, uh, you know, white collar criminals uh, to take that money and, 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 and squander it. It's, it's, it's not fair. So okay. that is state capture. Okay. So now we, we understand what, you, what, what drives you, but where does this manifest in your policies? Look, um, so what do you do? You come in and, uh, and, and immediately throw the state capture report away, nationalize the Reserve Bank. <laughs> yeah, I'm asking tangibly, what are people voting for? <laughs> so, so look, we, we, we're going to be uh, launching our people's mandate. People are referred to a manifest. Yes. You know, we, we're not, we don't do stadium politics. Yeah. Um, and you'll understand why when we launch our people's mandate. But we have a people's mandate. It's got eight pillars. I'm not going to go into details right now because for obvious reasons, it, it's, it's just two, two, three weeks away. Uh, mm -hmm. it, but it's going to be before the end of this month. Um, and you can call me and I will come. We can go in detail around yes. the, the, the... But you can give us a sneak peek, surely, at some of the main pillars over there. I mean, are you going to just be, uh, from, a, from a policy point of view, is this going to be... Real similarities with the EFF. So let's touch. Okay, let's let's touch on some of the, the, the policies. High level, high level. High level. Okay, that's all. If you look at um, the the network industries, right? The network industries that, that, that those are your your ESCOMs, your telecoms, your transnets. You know, uh, the, the, those that are services based. Um, today, if you look at the structure of the pricing for services that we offer whether it be water or whatever the case may be, uh, uh, telecommunications. The structure of the costing of the services and the pricing thereof, the costing is impacted by the loans that we're getting from the IMF and the World Bank in this current Sirama Posa led government. Because we're getting we're taking loans like no yeah, one's business. Yeah, absolutely. Right? And so what then happens is that when you have to structure the the, the the costing and the pricing for and you cost your 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 services and you price it. Uh, the downtrodden people aren't able to, and the normal average South African is not able to afford that. You know, um, that's why the cost of services is going through the roof because of these loans. Remember, during President Zuma's uh, tenure as president, President Zuma never 
took any loans. We owed nobody. We never took any more loans. And that's one of the things that also really uh, ticked uh, a lot of the West did in the likes of the World Bank and the likes of the IMF. They it ticked them off. And then all of a sudden there was all these uh, rating agencies that wanted to rate us. <laughs> Come on. It's, we know why. It is just tr pure propaganda but the fact that they know that they didn't, we didn't owe them, we're not indebted to them, and we're self-sufficient. And that's under President Zuma's presidency. Now, well, was that because of that, his presidency or because of the big balloon that uh, left behind by the Mbeki presidency? No, Mbeki presidency never left any balloon behind per se. Um, but we'll get back to that. So, so there's that. Um, so we, we need to deal with this issue of these loans because they affect our network industries and how we deliver services, right? And continues to indebt us to, 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 to Western banks, firstly. Second point is, if you look at um, the structure of this country's treasury, the national treasury, um, it's, it's, based, it's, it's an austerity-based framework, right? Um, and we need to bring about reforms to that again to unlock monies. If you look at for the past 10 years, what has transpired in the past 10 years, in the past 10 years, um, you know, banks, the major banks, have been focusing more on issuing microloans, not entrepreneurial, not SME-based loans. Businesses can't get money from banks because of this austerity measured uh, framework that, that is with Treasury right now. Um, whereas under President Zuma, Businesses flourished. And if you want to grow an economy and you want to create jobs, you need to focus on SMMEs. And by virtue of SMMEs flourishing, because SMMEs are the vortex and momentum of any economy, that's where the job creation comes in. But you can't do that if you've got an austerity-based treasury that is always holding back. And then you make it worse by then removing black economic empowerment off the back of that, when you know that that's actually where your base comes from. So th th that's another element where we're saying, Unlock, unlock funds. Let there be flow, a flow of funds in the country. You know, everything else will, 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 will fall into place. But again, you, you cannot do that that easily because, again, you've got lots of big loans, right? Um, so when it comes to finance and treasure in the economy, you know, I'm, trying to, I'm starting to show you what the thinking is here. Then you look at, uh, I'll give you another one, um, which brings in our tradition and our culture and, and, and private sector. If you look at, um, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a word for it, pluralism. Pluralism talks to uh, being able to take traditional medicine, right, and bringing it in to mainstream healthcare, so primary healthcare. So it's an 18 billion rand industry. We've got a lot of traditional healers. that have got a lot of medication, you know, uh, indigenous medication. We know this because... And guess who's leveraging a lot of those? It's, it's controlled mostly by, by white companies and, and, and maybe also some owned by Indian companies that are taking this medication and they're bringing it into the mainstream, manufacturing, bringing it to the mainstream and then selling it. Are these traditional healers benefiting from that? No. So we need to bring in a, a model of pluralism where we can take, these take the same traditional, let them also be economically involved in uh, this 18 billion rand uh, market and uh, work with uh, professionals in the healthcare space and be able to offer medication which is also indigenous to us, to, 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 to South Africans. You know, so j that's just maybe, yeah. I'll just touch okay. on some. That's uh, great. So let's, let's just uh, drill, uh, drill into some of those. Let's, let's talk about the legal system. Um, as somebody that doesn't understand, tell me about African law that uh, needs to be um, injected into our legal system. What changes? So, first and foremost, uh, let, let's go back to you know, uh, what, what we stand for and, and what we believe in. Traditional leaders ought to lead their subjects, right? First and foremost. Um, in the same way, you go to the UK, you've got the king and the queen. Yeah, but they're Wait, ceremonial. We'll get to that. We'll get the king and the queen, yes. right? But they're the custodians of the country. Well, Before, not really. No, they are. When a government gets formed, they have to, the prime minister goes to the king and the queen. Yeah, well, they, they've got and they, all they can do is just nod. They can they can do nothing about it. Well, you say they can do nothing about yeah. it, but the mere fact that a prime minister has to okay. acknowledge and right. have bi-weekly engagements updating the king and the queen about what is happening in the country right. that alone says a lot about their power. Okay. So you can't just you know uh, brush it off. They have a role to play, 
And we're saying the same here. Um, you know, where, where, where things went south is when our traditional leaders were, you know, uh, by virtue of what the, the, the past, uh, when, you know, they, they were not respected. They lost their dignity in the process and their respect that they had um, as royal families in their own right. Firstly, and, you know, there's, there's, there's a framework uh, that speaks to how we as, tradition, as, as Africans manage our affairs. Um, simple thing, you would have a tribal court, all right? Uh, so you've done wrong, uh, there'll be a tribal court uh, where your matter is then heard, or maybe if it's in the northwest side, they call it a lechotla, that's going to be the, you know, lechotla is a gathering, in effect, where the, the, the leaders... Uh, the henchmen and the chiefs would then sit, you know, and, uh, you know, preside over the matter and whatever the issues are. And they'd have an African solution. An African solution meaning, um, you know, you know, you may have to, if you've done wrong in a certain way, and sometimes, again, you have to interpret it in terms of our culture, because, you know, it's, it's, it's different how you interpret wrongdoing from a westernized way versus an African way. Um, we say, okay, you've done wrong, so by virtue of that, you need to, uh, you know, pay two cows. But remember, uh, paying with two cows is it's cows is a lot. That's a lot of money. That can't mm -hmm. be a fine, right? Because remember, these are same people that use the same cow to farm. So losing two cows is is it it it, it really has has an impact. I'm just using some 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 examples, but there, there are many more um, examples. And I'm saying, what we need to do is that this uh, constitution needs to be reflective and also the judicial system needs to be extended to uh, the traditional leaders and uh, the tribal councils. And I'll, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll touch on something very important as well. So, you know, the, today, a council of a municipality has got much more power than a king, right? Because they're not recognized whatsoever, right? Um, which is not wrong, which is wrong. It, it, it's not right, right? Um, and, and it cannot be. If we're going to, if we're going to bring in and instill uh, the values of the African child and uh, of the natives and ensure that this country is representative of us, that's why you're finding what we're seeing today, where you have teenage kids getting pregnant at a young age. That, that, it, it's, it's, it can't be, right? So you refer to the issue of, t yeah, well, you think that that's our policies. By the way, when President Zuma was speaking, it's the same, no different to you telling your child because you really want them, you, you really want them to take you seriously. enough. you'll say, well, if you do that again, I'm going to send you to the moon, you know, that they'll take you more seriously then, you know, as opposed to saying, no, well, if you do that again, uh, I'm not going to give you a sweetie. No, if you say to them, if you do that again, I'm going to take you to the moon, they understand the veracity of their actions. And that's what President Zuma was doing, just reflecting on, on what you said. So teenage pregnancy cannot be, it, it, it's becoming, a no, it's, it's normalized now. You know, why? Because there's a lot of Western culture, Eurocentric, Eurocentrism that's creeped in. So where, into, into, where into does our this, how does it, how does it manifest? Does this get written into the law books or does the law books go, carry over to traditional leaders who decides that teenage pregnancy is a bad idea uh, in a rural area, but a fine idea in Johannesburg? How is that uh, definition going to be? No, made? but it can't be a fine idea anyway. Okay, um, so is the law going to be changed? Whether you're black or white, it yes. can be a fine idea. Yeah, it, it, we, but is it going to be our, our kids cannot be burdening us is when it? we are retiring with their children. Mm. It, it can't be. So does it become criminalized? No, you don't have to criminalize it. You can't necessarily criminalize it. But you, you, you I mean, this is part of <coughs> will be the consultation process that we have to go through um, in engaging with, with the public. Remember, um, we talk about a democracy. Yet this country of ours and the structure of decision making, we still refer, you get 200 people passing laws and rights uh, on points of orders um, for 60 million people. And those 60 million people, we don't even know how this came about, what it means for us, but we just have to adapt. That's wrong. Um, it can't be that we only hold the, the you know, parliamentarians responsible for our lives. So we need to have a consultative approach. And I don't know at this point in time how that will look like. I've got some ideas, which I don't want to share right now because mm -hmm. it's pretty much in our manifesto. But it has to be a consultative process where we engage with our people. Mm. And our people mm. must then give us guidance. Remember, well, there's a lot of wisdom we can draw also from the traditional leaders. Um, 
there's a lot of uh, uh, wisdom we can draw from our white compatriots as well. We have also got insights. There's a lot of wisdom we can draw from our Indian compatriots, our colored compatriots. Because remember, we're a rainbow nation at the end of the day. And we need to live with each other. We, we need to... Another example. You know, we were having a discussion with President Zuma. And uh, that discussion, he said, we were saying, you know, uh, you'll never find Africans people anywhere else in the world. Africans are indigenous to South Africa. It's a fact, right? There's no country called Africans. Um, there's no other place where there's Africaners. Africaners are indigenous to South Africa. By the way, majority of the Africaners actually have Khoisan genes. <laughs> so, so, and it's true, right? Uh, so even with the Africans uh, community and the Africans, our Africans compatriots, we, we, we can draw a lot of wisdom from them too. Uh, because that's just the reality of us as South Africans. Um, we need to draw from each other to advance this country and it and, and, and becomes important that we engage so in a consultative manner. Okay, and if I, if I can touch on some of the, the, the really sort of uh, big talking points heading into the election, which I know you're going to come out with, uh, with your mandate soon. Uh, where does Mkonto with Sizwe stand on property rights? Well, <laughs> one of the things that we've stated continuously is why must, we, why must people be buying back what was stolen from them, Mike? Give me reason, reason me here. You know, why, why, must we, why must people, our people, our leaders, the true owners of the land, the originators of this country called South Africa, starting from the Khoisan, have to be buying back our land? How that was stolen? It, it, it's wrong, you know? Um, and at what price? Who, who, who values that? What valuation? What model? What formula do you use? You know, um, taking into consideration that that same land has benefited you economically for all these years, hundreds and hundreds of years, from all sorts of generations of your family. And then you want to sell it now? You've benefited from this land. It has given you, you've, 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 you know, you've reaped what you've sown. You know, you're rich now. You're a billionaire, most of them. You know, uh, you've got wine from some of them has, have got minerals some of them what's, what's even worse is in terms of let's go further the irrigation act you know which they carried through those rights from apartheid into to, uh, into this democracy this new dispensation can't even undo that and bring water reforms because the constitution they take the, the government to court before you know it in a certain decision that has to be made to overturn those irrigation rights in order for new water reforms to be brought into place guess what happens there's an act in the constitution that's always used that's why i say it's a it's an evergreen contract this constitution of itself is an evergreen contract to protect the few who benefited from from from, from the past so does it make sense for you mike that josini dam massive pool of resource of water the rights thereof are under one man. And there's a community, and there's very fertile land there for farming and agriculture. The community has to buy water, or let to put it this way, the government, make it even worse, buys water from him for the community. It, it can't be. And that's what's happening right now. Was water is now being commercialized. Yeah, was this different under President Zuma? No, and it's not to say there was different under President Zuma, but under President Zuma, if he had a two-third majority and he had the powers, if he could just make him, and that's why, you know, it would be good, it would be interesting to see if he made President Zuma, uh, you know, a, a, a dictator for just six months, what would happen? Yeah. You know, this country would be, you wouldn't be complaining. Yeah. Let me just put it that way, all yeah. right? But because President Zuma follows the law, and the letter of the law, for instance, the example that I gave is the fact that he didn't want to intervene in the issue of state capture, he let it go ahead and he formed it, right? If he was a dictator, he wouldn't have done so but because of what the, the reality is under president zuma he had adversaries that were pulling him down that was c continuously intervening making it making life difficult for him to implement what he wanted to implement that's just the reality if uh mbeki at the time when he had a two-third could overturn and change the constitution we wouldn't be having these problems that are perpetuated by the same constitution that's just the reality did his deputy try and get him to change uh, the constitution well, you know, you, you must know your place as a deputy. The deputy at the time was focusing on HIV and AIDS, and he, done, he did exactly that, and he did a great job at it. 
that was uh, one of the milestones that the deputy in the form of That's after 300,000 people were killed. Oh, well, 300,000 people killed because certain monies and well, firstly, the leader of the of the of, of the president at that point in time was talking about, you know, uh, sweet potato being what you could actually take uh, in order for you to to you know to heal from HIV and AIDS. I mean, come on, it's I mean, do we, using do medication. We, do we then blame and then, one and then, person? No, it's the fact that he's the leader. He was he was engaged. He was this was discussed with him. As far as I'm concerned, President uh, Mbeki, former President Mbeki, that's it, he should be held accountable for genocide. It's a fact hmm. um, because he took the money. You know, they yeah. ought to be focused and went and put it in arms deal. Much like if there was state capture, the President Ramaphosa, as the deputy president, must be held liable as much as the president, one would imagine. Well, what's, what's worse about uh, uh, Sir Ramaphosa, you know, uh, and his ANC is that he presided as deputy president over state owned entities because yes. he's, he's leader of government business. Um, he was chair of the war room for load shedding. Yeah. You know, so yeah. the man was involved. Okay, so, so he can't come now and say nine wasted years. You were the leader of yeah. all these state owned entities. What did you do? And President Zuma, when he was deputy yeah. and he was given the role of uh, dealing with HIV, he, he, he performed, he right. did his job. This man, in the form of President uh, Ramaphosa of ANC and his ANC, is a non-performer. Yeah, but I know that the ANC have probably taken up much of the space of looking backwards. We know their campaign is, you're better off now than you were 30 years ago. Uh, you don't think that MK runs the risk of doing the same thing, saying, look back only at uh, Ramaphosa, because I want to look forward as to what we can expect under an MK-inspired uh, government. Mm, absolutely. So we, where do you stand on immigration? Well, firstly, we've got porous borders. Uh, we have porous borders, and th this has contributed, um, you know, in a, in a multifaceted way negatively to our economy and to the country. Um, he, here's here's one crime. You know, uh, foreigners are coming here. Um, one because you can come here easily, just walk into, you just cross the, you know, the river Limpopo there. You, before you know it, you're in South mm -hmm. Africa. Um, it's easy to you know, uh, start a life here um, and to, 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 to hide and, uh, you know, start with illicit uh, activities. Um, it's easy. In the South African system and the environment is easy. That, that, that's, that's one. And that's why the foreigners are taking advantage of it. So we're saying we want to have, we're not saying we're against foreigners. We're saying we don't want illegal immigrants. If you're an illegal immigrant, you can't, from the UK, walk into France uh, and then you know, expect the French government to welcome you with open arms. It's, it doesn't happen. Why must it happen here? So we need to tighten our borders, first and foremost. If you're an illegal immigrant, we don't want you here, first and foremost, because we can't account for you and you continue to uh, put pressure now, on our resources we, and our economy. We understand that much of that pressure of the immigrants coming to South Africa comes from problems in our neighboring countries. Yes. Right now, once again, for nine years as president, uh, Jacob Zuma was very, very friendly with uh, President Robert Mugabe. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, as he continued to, to hurt that economy, which led to the influx of people, should he take any um, um, responsibility for some of our immigration problems? Well, firstly, I mean, President Zuma, at the time of his presidency, he was known as the chairperson and the godfather of uh, infrastructure. Um, how I believe we should be solving this is very simple. Um, we've got Transnet International, for instance, okay, um, which is sitting with billions of rands that we ought to be leveraging. We've got the IDC, we've got the PIC. IDC alone, which has got a developmental uh, mandate uh, for SADC in Africa, Take some funds. We've got mines in, 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 in Zimbabwe. Amazing uh, natural resources there. And man, uh, when it looks at agriculture, tobacco, there's, there's, there's huge, huge opportunity there. 
Why can't we use some of those monies to industrialize and get Zimbabweans to go and work there, get back, get them back home? Under the and current come, leadership, would that work? Well, it's it's a matter of you know how, how you how you discuss it and how you engage. I mean, we understand there's dynamics and so on, but we need to look at it this this way. We need to look at it in terms of the people of the country, not an individual. Um, but with what property rights do they have? How how could you do it with some kind of security? You're not just going to go and build a farm. No, ab- absolutely. In the hope that, uh, that, I mean, you, that those... you, you want tenure, you want security in knowing that the farm's not going to be overrun. Of course. I mean, and that, right. that, that, that gets brought into some of the bilateral agreements. But yet agreement. you don't want that here. No, that I'm saying that, that gets brought into the bilateral agreements. And, and the, those bilateral agreements, you know, will give credence okay, to so, exactly how you structure these so, kind of things. So we wouldn't be able to we wouldn't be able to talk about the details myself and yourself yes. right now but i'm just giving you thinking i'm just trying to yeah. get the the big uh, picture here so i love the idea we use south african funds we help our neighboring states uh, it used to happen in in the old south africa to be honest mm-hmm. And uh, rail networks and networks and so on and so forth. But in order to do that, you need some kind of security of ownership rights, etc. But you are have just said to me that those rights it, have to be removed in South Africa. No, 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 no. Um, we, we're not. Talk, we talk South Africa and Zimbabwe. Too, so we, we, we want rights for them, but not rights here. No, no. Hold on. I'm saying. That when it comes to, and let's not mix the two issues because we're talking about the issue of, uh, you're asking in terms of property rights as it pertains to the land yes. issue as well, right? I've answered you regarding that. In okay? South Africa. In South Africa, but yes. But you're saying but, invest but, in Zimbabwe. But remember, what, Zimbabwe. Spawned, what spawned the question of the investment of infrastructure, yes. for instance, in Zimbabwe is off the back of your question regarding immigration. Right. Right? So we're trying to find a solve for immigration. Yes. So, um, we're not saying we will have to engage with the Zimbabwean government in that case, whichever country that we would want to invest in, and say, um, how do we deal with the issue of of land or the property rights? I mean, um, they could say, well, we'll give you a lease uh, for uh, 50 years or 90 years, whatever the case may be, right? And uh, we then engage them on the basis of that. It doesn't mean that you have to own the land mm. or buy the land. No, mm. you know, we, we're putting in infrastructure, we're investing. Um, and we can see, the, obviously, the offspin of that investment, one from an issue of immigration, job creation, but also we see, you know, uh, but, but we're, sorry, cre- we're creating uh, industries. Know, also out of Sorry, Tlamula, if I, I'm banging on about this a bit, is that I'm, I'm a little bit uncertain. In this case, where you're talking about us investing there, mm-hmm. you're looking for some kind of securities. But when we talk about South Africans that want to invest here, you're saying there is not going to be any security. No, I'm saying there can be. So I'm, I'm saying there must be security of some sort. Okay, if you're coming in as an investor, okay, a- any investor. Does that include the current investors? Well, uh, the current investors. We have to have a discussion here. That's the reality. We have to have a we have to have a frank discussion, uh, Mike. Th- th- that's the reality of the situation. What I'm saying is, w- when it comes to foreign direct investors, so let's let's use an example. Someone wants to come and build a factory. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm less worried about okay. those people. I'm more worried about the South Africans. They are the chief investors in South Africa. Yeah. Oh, South Africans. Yes. Your example of the wine farm, right? Yes. Uh, that guy has invested and continues to ve- invest on a daily basis. Yeah, but remember. Right? I'm saying, I'm just saying, yeah. whether you like it or not, and it doesn't matter what the genesis is, that's a separate story. He's got that investment now, right? In, no, no, in as you, much as he's got a title deed that, that, that's on it at the moment, right? I'm, it is. I'm saying he can go and get a loan against it. He can go and do all sorts of things. And he's running businesses. Let's let's just go there because uh, that's the reality, right? South Africa is self-sufficient when it comes to food, right? And it's done on the back of that. We may not like where it started, but it is, right? So I'm asking the question of those people that have got those investments, will their investments be safe or not under an MK government? So... Let me go back to what I was, because I see you're using the Zimbabwe immigration well, I'm, question. No, I'm, I'm, I'm using it. I'm using it because. Be, but let's no, go back. Let's go no, back. Let, let me explain. That's fine. No, let's go back. Let's get, All no, I'm saying is that it. I don't know an investor in the world that doesn't you, want security. You, you invested. You've, you've, you've unpacked it. So let's let's talk about the the, the, the wine farm uh, situation, All right? Um, there are there, there are people, for instance, let's look at the Khoisan, right? The Khoisan, who are the rightful owners of most of that land in Stellenbosch. Fact. Where's their title deed? But they're the rightful owners. So all I'm saying is, um, why must it be that, uh, you know, this owner of this wine farm, when there's the rightful owners, 
continues to benefit from that land and these people continue to be left out at the Khoisan. That, that's, that, let's start from there. So I'm not saying that your investment uh, ought to now be usurped and, uh, you know, and your powers over the land need, need to be usurped. No, we, we, need, we need to find ways of how we then say to the Khoisan people, look, for instance, Khoisan people, uh, we know that this land uh, belongs to your ancestors. And that's a fact. It doesn't belong to those people that you find as investors. It's a reality. It belongs to the Khoisan. Let's find a way of how we ensure that the Khoisan people off the back of these proceeds that are coming from this land are taken care of. That's one way of also looking at it. So I'm not saying that it must be a, a land grab per se. And that's why I said it must be a consultative engagement in terms of how we resolve these issues. It, it can't be that they must sit on the sidelines whilst a few who, by the way, uh, are benefiting from the, the benefiting generations cannot share of the proceeds of the same land. It can't be. What kind of human being is that? You know? So, and, and these are the things that create anger and, 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 and bring the temperature to simmer to boiling point. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it, when, when you look at it from that perspective. So, it can't be. Uh, it, it has to be engaged. It, this is a discussion that has to be had. Um, the people, the rightful owners, need to be engaged accordingly. Mm -hmm. And it's not to say that we're going to take over your farm. Yeah, as of tomorrow, we take over. Now, we're not saying that per se. We're saying, let's sit across it's the, the table. It's the per se that worries me. No, well, it, it, well, it's the per se that should also make you feel comfortable. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> it right? Me, yeah, because it says... And by the way, you can have my farm. I have no farm. So I'm just talking about the principle because it's a, it's a, it's a very, very thin edge of the wedge. It's not it's so thin. It's the broad edge of the wedge, right? And that goes into property rights and all sorts of things. And, and mm -hmm. you know... Yeah. Okay, in the anyway. same way that it is a boiling point. It's a boiling point. In, in, in of its exactly. nature, right? Yeah. So uh, you need to find uh, some sort of middle ground in a way of how mm. you, 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 you resolve that. So, yeah. Okay. Can I just close off by asking you uh, one, one thing here? And that is that we have discussed, and you've mentioned many times, uh, opportunity missed when the ANC had two-thirds and could have changed constitution, etc. but they didn't. Now, MK's going into this election. Mm -hmm. uh, some bishops have been very excited saying that the, the, the MK will get two-thirds. There's a good chance they won't get two-thirds. You're hoping? No, no. Uh, Let me ask you something. Would you like, would you like MK to get two-thirds? I don't think it's I th would ideal you, in reality. Mike, would you like... MK no, I wouldn't like any Why? party to get two thirds. Why wouldn't you like it? Because or maybe I th you're waiting think, for a mandate first. Maybe you I can think, make a decision. Is that what it is? No, no, no. I'm saying that, uh, and I have no um, allegiance one way or another. I think that uh, that two thirds is a loaded gun for whoever has it, right? I hear you. Uh, okay. So I'm, I'm not a. I'm, in fact, I'm quite comfortable with the idea that no party gets a majority, and I think that's what is going to happen. So in all likelihood, MK is going to eat up. A share of the, of the ANC vote and some of the EFF vote and maybe even some of the IFP vote. Yeah, right. But it's probably at best going to be somewhere in the teens, right? Sorry, that's just uh, the way I'm seeing. Teens it. or teens? Teens. Okay, teens, not teens. No, no. Teens. <laughs> uh, how good will will MK be a, a, a parliamentary disruptor like the EFF, where nobody's allowed to speak, or will it be constructive? Let me put it this way. We're, we're, we're a party that uh, is focused on one thing. We want to see this country change. Um, and we are going to use the avenues available to us to do so. Um, parliament is what we respect to them. There's decorum there. You know, uh, when you're a member of parliament, um, you are a leader of society. You're a representation or a representative of this country. So how we engage and how we engage in our politics. That's why President Zuma always says, you know, a person that uses foul language doesn't have any politics. Um, we on our end are saying we've got politics. Um, we, are, we believe in our politics. We know our politics are going to transform this country. Um, and we'll follow the letter of the law to ensure that that happens, first and foremost. So uh, what, what we don't want to be finding ourselves is that when there's certain... Uh, needs of our people that ought to be taken into consideration we now have to be finding ourselves engaging in points of order continuously uh, ad nauseum having debates it, it can't be you know uh, we, we, we're stifling 
uh, this country, you know, with points of order and uh, unnecessary disruption. Um, let's find ways of how we hold people accountable. Let's find ways of how we circumnavigate the, the, the dynamics of parliament. It's, parliament is always going to be parliament. But that's why we want majority seats, so that we can have the influence and the power to be able to drive a certain outcome that is required and needed by our people as per the mandate that they give us. Klamulo and Lela, thank you so much for, uh, for coming to, to sit with, with me. I know that you've, you've really fitted this in. Uh, a lot of food for thought, definitely going to be shaking things up. Uh, all the very best for the elections. Good luck. I hope it's done in the right spirit and uh, that everybody is, is, uh, accepts the outcomes. Um, and uh, thank you so much for coming to the State of the Nation. To everybody that watched it, you see now why you should be subscribing to this channel eh? and supporting Case <laughs> Car Rental. We'll see you again on the State of the Nation. Thank Absolutely. you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Mike.